Very good. David Ross. Sure. Finitely many implies infinitely many part three. EKG. Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, this is going to be, I mean, this, this talk has a couple of, can, 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 you, can you hear me? People? Yes. Yeah, okay. You're fine. Yeah. This talk has a couple of parts. Um, uh, there's going to be a, a, an introduction to non-standard analysis a little bit, which will be sort of useless and insufficient for anyone who does no non-standard analysis. And it'll be long and uh, tedious for anybody who does know non-standard analysis. So apologies in advance to us, everybody. Um, okay, so um, just a minute, I've got, I've got something on my screen I don't want. How do I get rid of that? Okay, let's hide those. Okay, so um, first, a little bit of an introduction, and 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 the answer to the first question why I'm giving this talk, I think, is is is, is easy. This is penance for interrupting Mel last week during his talk on the, on the, uh, the similar subject, where I, I I tried to point out that 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 the non-standard proofs of of these uh, results of of Reese or Abian or Reese via Abian or whatever. Um, make some of the, the the reasons for some of the conditions a little bit uh, clearer. And so Mel was looking at results of the form, if a property P is true for every finite subset of a set of objects, and it's true simultaneously for all the objects, uh, in particular for looking at solutions for sets of equations. And this was, give a talk on this in November, and then a talk last week. And the thing is, these kinds of results are, are um, sort of bread and butter for mathematical logic. I mean, the compactness theorem is one of the foundational results in, in model theory. And so, for example, the De Bruyne Ardish result on, on coloring graphs is, is, is often given as, a, as, as sort of an elementary exercise in undergraduate logic classes. Uh, the machinery is just really well set up for that. And so it's not really surprising that they're natural proofs using non-standard analysis. So there's this result of Reese in particular, or maybe Abian, um, which has quite a simple non-standard proof. Uh, the translation to, the, to, to make it standard takes a little bit of, of work, but, but completely in the non-standard universe, it's, it's practically trivial, um, which is good because I'm, I, I wouldn't have come up with it otherwise. And we're going to take a look at it and see if we can uh, weaken some of the hypotheses. Um, okay, I'm just going to talk about the the, the linear case. And not for those of you who were here last week, not the polynomial case. The non-standard proofs are essentially essentially the same. Okay, so let's start with a review of non-standard analysis. And here's here's a standard and a non-standard universe. And sort of the fundamental theorem of non-standard analysis is that you can construct a non-standard universe with, with certain properties. So the standard universe is just a chunk of, of the mathematical universe, which has all the things that you want to talk about. So here I've got, you know, a few integers, 0, 1, and 2. I've got some real numbers. Um, I've got the, the natural numbers and the reals as sets or as objects. So this, 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 this natural numbers here, that's the object, the set of natural numbers. Um, it's got little lq, for example. It's got the set, set of continuous functions from little lq cross little lp to the reals. It's got anything you might want to have, but we usually cut it off somewhere so that it, uh, so that we don't we don't run into any of the usual set theoretic paradoxes. So what non-standard analysis brings, what Abraham Robinson did, was he constructed a non-standard universe, which is basically a similar collection of objects. Um, in an embedding, which is the star embedding, taking any of the objects in the standard universe to the non-standard universe. So for, for the object, which is the set of real numbers, there's an object star R. The object, which is a little LQ, there's an object star little LQ. And it's the same for all the little, for the, the, the basic elements like the real numbers and the integers that we usually drop the star for those. Strictly speaking, there should still be a star on pi or on e, especially if you want to think of a real number as a, I don't know, as an equivalence class of Dedekind cuts or something, equivalence class of, 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 of uh, Cauchy sequences, but we're not going to do that. Okay, so 
uh, what are some properties that we need for this non-standard extension for the star map? Well, the most basic one is a thing called transfer. And the transfer property is that every first order statement that's true in the standard use universe is true in the non-standard universe and vice versa. <clears throat> and for such a statement, I'm gonna be vague in what I mean by first order statement. I really mean that it's, it's star is true in the non-standard universe. These statements can refer to elements of the universe. And so you might have a statement referring to elements of the standard universe. And when you want to ask if it's true in the non-standard universe, you put stars on all the, the elements it refers to. And um, let's talk about some examples. So for example, three is a real number. So star three is an element of star. Um, and again, we usually drop the star from simple objects like three. Um, the natural numbers are a subset of the reals, and you can express that in a first order way by, by this sentence for all x in, in the natural. By the way, can you see my little my little crosshairs that I'm moving around on the uh, on the screen? Yeah, yes. it's, it's, it's yeah. visible. Okay. Okay. No problem. Okay, good, good. I never know. I'm using a, a, a PDF viewer that I don't usually use because I'm using a computer I don't usually use. So, 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 okay. So you can express the fact that the natural numbers are a subset of the reals in a first order way. And so if we star everything, including you know the natural numbers of the reals, this says that every star natural number is a star real. And, and that's true for any two standard sets. If one standard set's a subset of another, then so the, the, the star satisfies the same property. Abelian property uh, for addition in the reals is expressible. And so uh, it's expressible for the star reals as well. So the, the, the corresponding star operation, star plus on the star reals is also abelian. And again, we'll usually drop the star from, from those, those operations. And in fact, this is true for all of the usual field operations and also the usual ordered operations. So star R is an ordered field if you take a look at this, if you use the stars of the, of the usual operations on star R. Um, star also preserves finite Boolean operations. If C is the intersection of A and B, then star C is the intersection of star A and star B. All these sorts of things you can express in a first order way, and so they, they hold. If A is a finite set in the standard universe, so let's suppose A consists of the elements A1 through AN, then you can express the fact, you can, you can basically describe A in a, in a single first order sentence. Here are the dot, dot, dots in the sentence, or there's just a finite amount of stuff that I'm omitting in the ellipsis. Um, so that says that star A also consists of star little a1, star little a2, and so on, up to star little an. So finite sets don't get bigger in the non-standard universe. But we can construct a non-standard universe in such a way that the following property is that property holds. I'm calling it the infinite set property. If you have an infinite set in the standard universe, then its star gets bigger in the sense that if you look at the set of all things of the form star of little a, where a is an element of the original set, capital A, it's a proper subset of star big A. So for example, the star reals contains all the standard reals. It contains 0, 1, 2, pi, e, etc. But it also contains some new, new stuff it's not just the star of something that was in the original. Okay, and this, in some sense, is not really an independent property. It really follows from one I'll be having further down, but I'm going to state it as an independent property. Just having those two things, having the the fact that 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 uh, infinite sets get gets bigger, already gives you a lot of a lot of power for for using non-standard analysis. And so let's talk a little bit about what the reals look like. So star R is a proper ordered field extension of R. Um, and any such thing, anytime you do a proper ordered field extension of R, you automatically get infinitesimals. So it has a positive infinitesimal. There's a lot of them, but let's say it's got one called epsilon. And that means that epsilon is positive. And for any standard natural number n, the standard positive uh, natural number n, negative 1 over n. Um, is less than, well, zero actually is less than epsilon is less than one over n. Um, and one over epsilon is larger in absolute value than every positive integer n, so there are infinite elements in star r. So we can, we can break star r into three parts. The finite part, which contains some infinitesimals, 
an infinite part which contains reciprocals of infinitesimals. Um, and we write P infinitesimally close to Q with this, this, this approximation symbol if the difference is an infinitesimal. And, and this is true for any proper ordered field extension of R, uh, any ordered field which properly extends R. Um, you get this kind of a structure. And of course, there are a lot of those, not just the ones constructed with non-standard analysis, uh, Laurent series, the, the Dane field, which Dane used to do some, uh, some um, uh, non-Euclidean geometry, uh, stuff like that, stuff like that. Okay, so here's this picture again, but I've added underneath the star, I've added R again. And so there's some useful properties of arithmetic in star R. And this is really known about watch, so I can't keep track of time. Um, so being infinitesimally close to an equivalence relation on, on star R, um, the finite and infinitesimal elements of star R are subrings of star R. If you add two infinitesimals, you're infinitesimal. If you add two finite elements, they're finite. Uh, they're not fields because the reciprocal of an infinitesimal is infinite. And so um, neither the infinitesimals nor the finite elements are, are fields, but they're, they're rings. The infinitesimals form a maximal a multiplicative ideal in the finite elements that is an infinitesimal times a finite element is infinitesimal. Um, and an interesting, this is really a topological fact about, um, about the finite elements, is that every finite element um, is infinitesimally close to a unique standard element, a unique element of the original, the original R. So we call the map taking any element of the finite um, Part of star R to its element of, of, of the original R to its, its, its standard real, the standard part map. And what we're basically doing is rounding down uh, elements of the finite part of R down to its nearest uh, standard element. Um, and um, that has some nice properties too. It's a ring homomorphism. Um, it's it's um, it impotent on the on the um, well, on the standard elements of, of, uh, of the reals, but the, the three homomorphism we're gonna be using, oh, that works, we're gonna be using a lot. So the standard part of X plus Y is the standard, oh, this is not working well, standard part of X plus the standard part of Y and so on. Um, as long as this is a finite sum, okay. so we have this this, this non-standard uh, reals. We've got a part that we can somehow push down to the or push down or round off to the standard reals, and and this is quite useful. And, and this uses, by the way, the completeness of the standard reals in an essential way. It's sort of a nice exercise to show that that that, that this is the case. Anyway. So property of the non-standard extension, we've talked about transfer, we've talked about the infinite set property. The one that's really useful for these, these uh, results of the sort that Mel has been talking about is the saturation property. Um, and the saturation property says this, suppose you've got a family of sets in the standard universe. So this is a standard family of sets indexed by some standard index sets, often the natural numbers, but it could be any, any index set. And suppose this collection of sets satisfies the finite intersection property. That means if you take any finite number of them, their intersection's not empty. Then in fact, well, the whole intersection might be empty, but if you take the intersection, not of all of these A sub I's, but of the star A sub I's, that's not empty. And that means there's some element of the non-standard universe which is in the, the intersection of the stars of the A sub I's. So we've got a bunch of sets to satisfy the finite intersection property in the standard universe. Um, in the non-standard universe, you can find something in, in all of their, their images, all of their stars. Um, 
And the, there's an important distinction here. In general, if you take a look at the intersection over I and capital I, I'm sorry, the capital I in this font comes out just looking like a diagonal slash. I probably should have used a different index or maybe a different font. The intersection of the star A sub I's is different from the star of the intersection of the A sub I's. The star of the intersection of the A sub I's, so the intersection of the A sub I's is a, is a standard set. If you take its star, that's the same as basically looking at the intersection for I and star I of, um, so we have this sequence up here. We have a sequence A sub I over I, and that sequence we can take its star. So what is the sequence? The sequence is a function whose domain is capital I and is range, it takes values a bunch of sets. Star of that is going to be a function whose domain is star I and takes a bunch of sets as well. So if we call that sequence index by star I, star A sub I, then that's going to look like that. So it's, it's, a, it's an intersection over a bigger set of sets. And so that, that could be empty, but where, where the, this original one might not be. So this is the this is the fundamental property we're going to be using. And I should say there are a lot of things that go under the name saturation. This is a relatively weak form of saturation. Um, nowadays, for a lot of applications, we want to use stronger forms of saturation. And this is one of the, the basic things you build into non-standard models is some high degree of saturation. And so, for example, if you're using these methods in additive number theory, as a lot of people do nowadays, you tend to work with, with a higher form of saturation. But this is all we need for today. Okay. Um, let's see. And saturation is equivalent, and this is what I'm writing here is fairly vague. Saturation is equivalent to the idea if you've got a uh, a collection of standard assertions, and by that I mean first order, about some element of X, element X indexed by some standard set. And these assertions are finitely satisfiable in the standard universe. So for any finite number of them, there's some X that satisfies all of those finitely many assertions. Then there's actually an X in the non-standard universe that satisfies all of them. And so these could be equations, it could be inequalities, it could be basically anything. And so the, the, the usual example that people bring up is this one. Consider the assertions x is a real number, x is positive, x is less than one, x is less than a half, x is less than a third, x is less than a fourth, and so on. That's a set of assertions indexed by the natural numbers. Any finite number of them, um, you can just pick an x less than the smallest fraction that shows up on the right of an inequality, and that shows that they're finitely satisfiable. Well, that says that in the non-standard reals, there's some element satisfying all of them, and that's going to be a positive infinitesimal. Now, we already have positive infinitesimals by virtue of being a uh, um, satisfying this infinite set property, but this is a, a more explicit way of showing there exists a positive infinitesimal. And this is similar in some ways to some of these, these results that, that, that I was talking about last week and back at the end of November. And so Mel mentioned the, the De Bruyne Erdős result about about coloring graphs. I'll just point out that you can do this very simply using saturation and then using non-standard analysis. So if you've got an infinite graph such that every finite subgraph is k-colorable, it means you can you can assign a color to every vertex such that no neighboring um, nodes have the same color. We're going to use um, we can let F be the set of basically color, well, the set of all potential colorings, all functions from, from the set of vertices to one to K. And we let our index set be finite subsets of the set of vertices. So an element of I is a, well, it's a finite set of vertices, and that gives rise to a finite subgraph. And for each such I, we can let A sub I be the set of, 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 of these elements, script F, potential colorings, such that the restriction to 
that finite set of vertices mentioned in I is a, is a, is a, is a permissible coloring, is one that, that colors the graph without giving the same color to adjacent um, vertices. What we're told is that every such A sub I um, is not empty. But we also know that if you look at A sub I intersect A sub J, that's a superset of A sub I union J, which is a finite set. So these, 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 these A sub I's have the finite intersection property. And that means that there's an F in the intersection of the stars of the A sub I's. And what's that F gonna be? Well, it's gonna be a function from star V, the set of uh, the, 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 the star of the set of vertices, which is gonna be a, a much bigger set, presumably. So we've got the star graph, which is a, an extension of the original graph. But F is now a, um, um, oops, this is wrong. It's not a K coloring. It's not a K coloring of G, but it does assign colors. It may, it may sign adjacent vertices the same, um, the same um, colors. But if you restrict it to V, it's going to be a K coloring of G. And that's not too hard to show. Okay, so things like that are, are become quite easy in non-standard using non-standard machinery. So let's get back to solving equations. I'll start with a warm up, and I think Mel mentioned this example two talks ago. This is an example of obvious, uh, well, the result of obvious. So let's suppose we have a finite ring. We let script F or Fractor F, I guess it really is, is a set of finite polynomials. By that I mean the polynomials only refer to finitely many, um, have finitely many coordinates, but there are possibly infinitely many variables altogether. So any, any polynomial in this script F or Fractor F can only refer to finitely many of the infinitely many variables around. And let's suppose that every finite subset of this F has a common, has a common root. That is that for any finite set of these polynomials, there exists a, a sequence of elements of their finite ring indexed by I so that if we plug in the appropriate ones into each of these polynomials, P sub K, we get zero. Um, then there exists um, an assignment, there exists a, a, um, an assignment of values of the ring to variables or an X and R to the I, which works for all the polynomials in script F. And, and how do we prove that? Well, by saturation, we get an X in star R to the I. This is going to be a function from star I to star R, um, such that when we plug this X in to the elements, so we're, in, we're, we're just looking at the P's that are indexed by F and not by star F to apply saturation. So we just look at the P's assigned by star F, we can make sure that we can have our X make them all zero. It may not make some of the other elements of star F that are not in the original F um, zero, but it makes all the, the P's, it's a root for all the, the standard P's. And that's the application of saturation using the standard indexing um, of the fractor F. So anyway, the, 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 these X's work for star P's, um, the star of the polynomials, but these star polynomials really only refer to standard, standardly many variables. Um, and their coefficients are in R uh, originally because they're given as standard polynomials. And this X, is defined on all of star R, but we can star I, but we can restrict it to the original I and just ignore all the all the values that are not uh, indexed by one of the original um, variable indices. Um, and so, if we plug that X, we'll restrict to, to I and to P, and we can do that because all the 
R is finite, so R and star are exactly the same. So every every X sub I is a standard element of R. Then it's just going to be the same. It's going to be the same as star P of the original X. And we know those guys are all zero. So P of this X where we've just thrown away all of the non-standard indices is zero for every P in the original set. And that's what we want to prove that there exists such an X and that this, this X, this restriction of the non-standard X to the, to the standard indices works. So that's the uh, proof of, the, the, of this result. And we can do the same with polynomials over R. So let's suppose we've got a set of, of, of real polynomials. Again, there might be infinitely many variables. So we've got an infinite uh, index set for the variables. And, um, but we've got a bunch of polynomials with just, they only have finitely many, um, finitely many uh, uh, variables for each of those. And let's suppose that every finite subset of the script F has a common root bounded by M. Now, if we drop this bounded by M condition, um, the rest of the result fails. And there's, there's an example due to Albion showing that this example fails if you don't have some kind of bound. But if you also assume that that root is bounded, so all the, so all the X sub I's are between negative M and M for some M, um, then there exists an X. Um, that works for all of them. And we, 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 we start exactly as in the other, the other example. We start by taking, there's an X, um, which is now going to be a function from star I into, um, into the star of the interval from negative M to M. So that will contain some non-standard elements as well as the standard elements between negative M and M, which works for all the, the elements in the original script F. It may not work for any of the non-standard ones, but it works for star of all of those, those P's. Now, the thing is for any standard index I, because this X sub I is bounded, this should be a less than or equal to. Um, this should be a less than or equal to, but it's got a standard part because it's part of the finite finite hyper reals, the finite star reals. So we can take a standard part, call it y sub i. So the, the final sequence of y's indexed by capital I is one of the kinds of solutions we're looking for. At least it's one of the kinds of elements we're looking for. Moreover, if you take a look at one of these, a standard polynomial and apply it to um, uh, well, I apply it to, to, to one of the restrictions, the restriction of X to the standard indices. Well, the standard polynomial, it's got standard coefficients um, and standard powers. So by virtue of the fact we've, we're, we're, that, that, the stand, that the standard part is a um, uh, ring homomorphism, um, it's just going to be infinitesimally close to um, the original polynomial applied to Y. And so P of Y is zero for every, for every uh, standard P. And so that proves this, this version. And a couple of remarks, the proof continues to work. The only place we used the, the capital M really was for taking the standard part here. So it actually works if we have a different M sub I bounding each of the individual components in the original setup. And so if we can change the hypothesis and conclusion to the X's being in, in this product of the intervals negative M sub I to I, um, it can actually generalize as polynomials can be replaced by any continuous functions, as long as the continuous functions only uh, refer to finitely many variables. And we can even replace the reals by arbitrary Hausdorff topological spaces if we replace these, these intervals by compact sets, but um, that's beyond the scope of this talk. But the same proof just works. Okay. Um, so now let's talk about functions of infinitely many variables, what we really want to talk about for this, for this talk. Um, so just some notation. 
I'm going to use bold phase to A for sequences of real numbers. Um, indexed by the natural numbers. Um, bold phase to A sub I is not going to be the ith component of A. That's non-bold phase to A sub I would be the not the the, the, not, the uh, ith component of A. Bold phase to A sub I is going to be um, the ith sequence of real numbers. In other words, we're doubly we, we have we have a doubly indexed. Uh, sequence of real numbers indexed by the natural numbers and indexed by little i, where little i, I haven't said, it's going to be over some index set. It could be the natural numbers, it could be anything. Um, here it's going to be mainly the natural the uh, natural numbers. And so I'm going to, I'm going to just use the dot product notation for the inner product is just the sum of the a sub n's, b sub n's, if a and b are two of these sequences. And I'm going to let um, a superset or uh, uh, capital N for an N natural number be the sequence where you throw away the first N um, coordinates. So, I mean, they're still there. They're just all turned into zero. Um, and that's just notationally, it'll be, it'll be useful to do that. So, we're dropping the first N coordinates. We're going to call that um, bold phase A super N. And some simple facts about LQ, the, the, the uh, Q summable uh, sequences. If you've got a Q summable sequence and you throw away the first uh, N coordinates, it's still Q summable. That's the first um, simple fact. Um, second simple fact is that if you look at the tails, so if you look at the uh, uh, Q norm of what you get if you throw away the first, the first N coordinates, uh, the limit of that as capital N goes to infinity is zero, and that's actually if and only if. That that's well, of course, this is this is finite if and only if uh, things in LQ. So, but um, and also the individual the individual coordinates are bounded by the uh, the Q norm of A. I think those are those are easy and obvious. So this is the theorem uh, that we're talking about. Suppose you've got a bound M and you've got conjugate exponents P and Q. Um, suppose you've got some infinite set of um, probably just the natural numbers, but let's say any infinite set of, of these, these A sub I, these sets of coefficients in LP. And suppose you've got likewise an index set of real numbers. And suppose that for any finite subset of the index set, we've got um, we can get a simultaneous equation to um, the summation equation, which is the same thing as looking at boldface a sub i dot x equals b sub i. And we can do that in such a way that the x's are in LQ and their Q norm is less than or equal to m. So suppose we could do that for every every finite subset of capital I, then in fact, you can find a common solution satisfying all of these, these equations uh, simultaneously. So this is the theorem, which with Abian proves and ascribes to Rees. And um, Rees has sort of a different result, but it's not tremendously difficult to use the Rees result and, and, and get the Abian result. And the Reese result uses basically Bonnach, some form of the Bonnach, Han Bonnach extension theorem. Um, although the Reese result is 1903, and we usually think of the Han Bonnach theorem as being in the 20s. Um, and um, I guess the Abin result does sort of the same thing. So um, we're going to show it non standardly, and the non standard proof. And the observation is the non-standard proof that I'm going to give is very, very similar for anybody who knows non-standard analysis to the non-standard proof of the Tikhonov theorem. And that made it possible to translate this into a standard argument using the Tikhonov theorem. And that's the one that, 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 that Mel presented uh, last week, although he did a fairly nice, fairly strong generalization, not just the linear case. Okay, so this is the theorem we're going to put. So first of all, 
since uh, for every finite subset of the equations, there's a, an element of LQ with these that, that satisfy them. By saturation, there's an X and star LQ, whatever that is, such that it's star LQ norm. This should probably have a star on this norm, but I'm gonna drop it because this is an element of star LQ. So the star LQ norm is less than or equal to M and it satisfies the corresponding equation for each standard index. It may not for some of the non-standard indices, but it satisfies them for the standard indices. Now I want to take this, this, this X and use it to create a standard sequence. And I'm going to do it in the following way. For a standard ah, I've changed my I to an N here. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to use capital I and the natural numbers interchangeably. Did I do that? No, I, I'm, I take it back. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. Bold-faced X is indexed by the natural numbers, by the, by, by, by the star natural numbers. So I'm going to find a standard sequence by ignoring the star natural numbers, ignoring the star, any, any component of, of bold-faced X, which is indexed by an infinite uh, element of star N, and just look at the ones indexed by the standard elements of star N. And I take that X sub N, and we know that that X sub N in absolute values is less than or equal to capital N, which means it has a standard part. All of the finite elements of star R, you can round down to the nearest standard part. So we do that. We let Y sub N be the standard part of X sub N. And in some sense, we're done. We now have our candidate for the solution, namely um, the sequence of Y sub Ns. That part was easy. The hard part is really just to show that it works, to show that that boldface Y is in, is in LQ. The boldface Y's Q norm is less than or equal to M. I mean, this is just a standard thing now. So we're talking about standard LQ and standard M, and that it satisfies all these, these equations for, for standard indices. And, and that follows from the following chain of, of equalities or approximate equalities which looks simple, but there's an incredible amount of stuff hiding here. So let's just, up to some standard capital N, let's take a look at the, the, the Y sub N to the Q's power, right? Because we want to add all of these up to get the, 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 um, the Q norm of the Y sub Ns. Well, first of all, this Y sub N equals the standard part of X sub N. So, so far, we're just, it's just definition. Now, the standard part, the absolute value of the standard part of X sub N is the same as we can take the standard part outside the absolute value. It's the same, let's see if I try again to write, probably not gonna be able to. This, oh good, is the same as the standard part of the absolute value of X sub N, um, the Q. And I'm using a couple of things there. One thing I'm using is I'm using the fact that the standard part map respects continuous functions. Now, I didn't mention that earlier on, but um, you can actually use this non-standardly to define continuous functions. But the standard part map passes through continuous functions. And we know the absolute value function is continuous. And taking things to the Q's power is continuous. Um, so we can pull the standard part map outside of that. And now it's... Um, it's a um, um, it's a it's a ring homomorphism. We can pull it out, and this is a finite sum because capital N. We, we started with a finite capital N, so we can pull it outside the finite sum. So this equals this. Okay. Um, and now the standard part of this is infinitesimally close to the thing we start with. So we remove the standard part, we're approximately equal. And now this thing is less than or equal to n to the q. Why is that? Well, this is all working non-standard. This is because this is because a bold faith x q is less than or equal to m. And this is working in the non-standard universe. So this inequality comes from this fact, which lives in the non-standard universe. Also the fact that that if we um, if we 
put it off at the nth power. That's less than or equal to that. And that's again working in the non standard universe. Um, so this is all in the non standard, this is all in the non standard universe, this, this part. So it's again hiding some important information. But if we ignore everything but the first component and the last component, these guys are standard. So this really is less than or equal to, to this, and those are that's a standard inequality. So we could let capital N go to infinity, and that proves that the um, qth power of the q norm of the y's is less than or equal to the qth power of m. So that proves that y is an LQ and it has q q norm less than or equal to capital N. Finally, to prove that that um, to prove the third the third part, well, we, we, it's it's nice working with finite things because um, uh, there with the standard part map passes through the finite sum. On the other hand, it's also nice working with infinite things because then we can, like we did here, we can apply transfer to these facts about the inequalities. And so let's take a look at b sub i. Let's take a look at the difference between b sub i and an initial. Uh, an initial partial sum of the a sub i n's, y sub n's. Well, if we replace the y n's with the x sub n's, it, uh, we only differ by an infinitesimal. Um, and now that difference, this is all non-standard stuff, so we can take that difference and get the, um, and get this sum, the sum for n bigger than capital N. And now I'm going to use the star of the holder inequality, right? Um, bold faced A sub I capital N, its star is in star L, LP, and bold faced X is in star LQ, so I can apply the star holder inequality to get this inequality. And this thing now is just some finite number. In fact, it's less than or equal to capital M. So I could replace this 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 um, uh, norm of of x by capital M, and then just have a standard inequality, and this right hand term goes to zero as n goes to infinity because this thing is bounded. And so that proves that proves three, and that proves the theorem. So that's the non-standard proof. Okay, so it's it's really pretty straightforward. There's a couple of places where we have to pay attention to some, use some of these bounding facts for inequalities. Okay. So the, we can ask the same question with weakened hypothesis and ask if that's possible. And I mentioned this last week. Suppose we replace the condition that that, that our, our um, solutions to the finite, so this is the, the solution to the finite um, collection of equations bounded by M. Suppose we replace that with the condition that that for any for all n the nth component of our solutions is bounded by some capital M sub n. So we fix some sequence of positive numbers to replace the capital M, and and ask what if we what if we replace the condition by by that condition. And if you look at the proof, and I've copied some of it over here, it basically it starts going through. So by saturation, you get a bold faced X in LQ such that this thing is true. So this this, uh, um, this new condition is true, and that satisfies all the standard equations, the equations for standard um, indices. And we can again create the standard sequence of y sub n's by taking the standard part component y's because we've forced all these x sub n's to be finite. And by analogy with the other proof, we want to prove these three things: that y is an LQ, that this inequality condition holds and that we satisfy the equation. And if you try to do the same thing, you get to this point, but then you get stuck because the norm of x to the q's power is not necessarily finite. So we don't have a standard inequality on the y's. So you can't just let n go to infinity and prove condition one. Condition two does hold. But without condition one, you can't prove condition three. 
And you could do it if everything was uniformly bounded. So if all the m sub n's were bounded by some fixed m, then you could still get you could still get everything going through because you could replace this thing with the with that um, common bound. But without any more information, you can't make it go through. So we get a natural candidate for the common solution, but we can't use the same argument to show it works. So the question is, how can we modify it? And I've got one, I've got one modification that works. And we're just noticing that, that, that y is an LQ if and only if the sequence of tails goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So instead of having um, my condition with every finite set of equations being that, that the, the, the solution to the finite set of equations is has norm less than or equal to m, I'm going to replace it by a condition that its tail goes to zero, and I'm going to replace it by a condition saying that it does that in some kind of uniform way. So same setup, we've got a set of, 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 of equations, an infinite set of equations for a, kind of a couple, pair of conjugate um, exponents. And now I'm going to claim the following are equivalent. First is that there exists an x satisfying all the equations and also satisfying that the x sub n's are bounded by the m sub n's for all n. That's true if and only if there exists some positive sequence of epsilons going to zero with the property so that for that, that one sequence, for every finite subset of the i's, there's an x such that the x sub n's are bounded by m sub n's, the x satisfies the, the, the equations for this, this, this finite set of equations, and also the tails of the x sub n's, the tail q norm of the x sub n's is less than epsilon sub n for all n. So this is, this is, these are equivalent. And one, one implies two, um, you just let epsilon n be the, the tail of the, for the, for the x that works for all of them, you let it be the, 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 the tail of that x. And then that, that, that gives you two for that epsilon sub n. In the other direction, what you do is you proceed as we did before, and we're going to use the epsilon sub n's to do our bounding. So first, you don't take n going from capital N to infinity. You take capital N going to some finite k, and we look at the sum of the y sub n's to the q's. We created the y sub n's as before. That's approximately equal to the corresponding things for the x sub n's. Well, that sum now is less than or equal to what we get if we look at all the, 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 the little x sub n's going on up, including the non-standard ones. So if we look at bold-faced x, where we cut off the, the finite number of the original components, and we're given that that's less than epsilon sub capital N to the Q. In other words, um, the Q norm of the, of, of the bold-faced y, if we cut off the first n coordinates, so the first n coordinates equal to zero is less than or equal to this, this epsilon sub capital N. And that's a standard inequality. And since these epsilon sub n's go to zero, by the earlier observation, um, boldface y is an LQ and, and the result follows. So we do have this, this kind of result. We also have a result that we just never care about solutions being in LQ. So suppose the M sub, we're given some M sub n's bigger than zero for n in capital N. We have an infinite set of equations. The A sub i's are just sequences of real numbers. We don't know if they're bold faced A sub i's in LQ or not. For any Q, B sub i's are solutions. Then the following are equivalent. There exists some X. Um, where the individual co coordinates are bounded by these m sub n's, satisfying all the equations, a sub i dot x equals b sub i for all i. Nothing here about, about, about LQ. And the second one is that there exists a sequence. So if we think of these epsilon sub i's in the pre, or epsilon sub n's in the previous results as being sort of a modulus of convergence, there exists some modulus of converge, moduli of convergence, one for every equation. 
each of which goes to zero. So for each i, the epsilon sub i n's go to zero as n goes to infinity, such that for each i prime, there's an x with the appropriate bounds on the coordinates, such that the inner product of the x sub n's and the a sub n's are bounded by this modulus of convergence um, for all n and for all i and i prime, and the x satisfies the equation. And these two are equivalent. And again, it's following through the, the previous argument, but with the place where you want to do an inequality, we use this modulus. We, we, don't, we don't go as far as using holder. So we don't have to use holder. We just apply this, this result, this thing I'm, I'm labeling A here, 2A. We apply that to, the, to this inner product. And then it goes through. OK, so um, that, that's basically what I prepared. Um, and um, yeah, so you know, it's probably not the best possible condition. It's, it's, it's still nice to, to be nice to figure out sort of the actual conditions that make the um, Abian or the, the, the Reese theorem, the Abian Reese theorem go through without this, this bound. But uh, it, 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 is, it is some, you know, it, 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 it's at least some kind of improvement. And in any event, it's, it, I'm trying to leverage the fact that you get a solution. Whether or not you can prove it works, you get this candidate. So the question is, what can we do to make this candidate actually actually work as a solution? And this is sort of a nice thing about the not standard approach is that you get you get a candidate very quickly without really using much machinery. And then the question is, how do you make this, this you know, what do we need to make this candidate? Okay, that's it. Oh, very good. Um, any questions for David? I have a question. So, I mean, did your very, very last theorem say something like you have an infinite set of linear equations, and if every finite subset of the equations has an approximate solution, then the whole set of equations has a an actual solution? Um. No, oh, I mean, can it be, um, hmm. So that's yeah. not what the condition A means, because I guess the condition no, A is not just what the condition at the details. Means, but I believe, for example, um, you could add for every finite I prime and for every epsilon bigger than zero, you could add that that um, the difference of these two things is less than epsilon. I believe that that would imply that would imply one. So you could get also that that you can get an, that given approximate solutions, arbitrarily good approximate solutions, you could actually get a a, a full solution for everything. I I, I I suspect that that's the case. But the condition A in particular is not talking about approximate solutions. It's mm -hmm. it's just it's it's just a, an additional bounding. It's basically talking about how quickly. Um, yeah, it, it's just a bounding. It's a bounding condition. So I guess my question is something like this: If uh, you have your set of linear equations, uh, and uh, if suppose that for every epsilon, and for every finite set of the equations. There's some uh, there's some set of x's such that if you look at like L of x minus v, right? The L of yeah. x is the, right. Uh, if yeah. that's less than epsilon, uh, so if you can I, find like a, an approximate solution within epsilon for every finite set for every epsilon, does that I, apply? I, I, I think that's to the, true, but but. But you still need something, I think, to make that go through. I, I think that part goes through, but I still need think you need something to, you need to be able to say something about the rate of convergence. Maybe the series. Well, also. Right. So, 
you know, I think that, mm -hmm. I think that this that this condition A, something like this condition A, because this condition A is substituting for the bounding condition. Yeah, it's it's yeah. some weak form of summability condition. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um I think you still need something like that, some kind of statement that all the all the uh the equations in the finite set in the I prime that the it solves them kind of at the same rate. But I believe you can also change the B to be an approximate condition. Um, that's probably true, but for the original Reese theorem too, you could probably could probably change that to be an approximate condition in the original Reese theorem where they're bounded by capital. Um, but I, I don't think we can get away with getting rid of this this kind of this kind of summability condition, which the original capital M gives you. Right. Let's see. Um, Let's see. Uh, David, if you're done, can you uh, end the screen share so we can get back to? Oh, good. Let me see. View gallery. Okay, so everyone's visible again. Uh, and 